Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm, I'm very pleased to open this session, which is called Precision Programming, Using Data to Deliver the Right Programs to the Right People. We have a, a number of great speakers. Um, as you all know, data is critical, and good data is particularly quick, critical to help drive um, precision programs. Um, we're going to jump straight into the, the presentations. I'm not going to give a lot of background. Um, because our first speaker has to leave, we're going to, after she's been introduced and done her presentation, we're going to take a number of qu questions then. And then after that, we'll take all the questions at the end. So please hold your questions apart from the first speaker. So without further ado, we'll introduce the speakers as, as, as they come to the podium and give short, short bios. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Sibu. Sibu. Thank you. Thank you, Ade. Good afternoon, everybody. Without wasting any time, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Debbie. Um, from the United States. Debbie's ambassador at large, um, Deborah L. Burks, MD, is the coordinator of the United States government activities to combat HIV and AIDS and U.S. special representative for global health diplomacy. That's Over great. to you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your brevity. Um, so I really wanted to go into some of the data in a little bit deeper way um, for this talk. So I'll go quickly, but we'll go deeper. Um, and all of you know about the youth wave, um, and all of you know about this data that's coming out of the FIAs. And this is. Funds now. Funds now. Funds You're now. right. Funds now. Wow. Funds now. Funds now. Funds now. No. Funds now. What happened? Come bring them. Baby We're watching. Now. Okay, great. So can Baby I answer this now. really quickly? Because I had it in my Jonathan Mann lecture. I did. Because you know I'm very transparent. So we put our KP investment funds through a different mechanism. I was intent to make it work. And I never take no for an answer, but after two years of not being able to move the money the way we needed to move the money down to indigenous organizations, we pulled the money back out of the State Department, and all of the money is going back out in its entirety through our agencies, DOD, USAID, and CDC, only to indigenous organizations and only for services for prevention and treatments. Oh, you have an ask. Another ask? Well, this was about that ask. Yes, okay. So we, we want to thank you for all of your support. And we know like PEPFA and the, and the U.S. government has been supporting key population over the years. But KPIF was launched two years ago yes. after a lot of advocacy that we did during the high-level meeting in New York. We did a lot of work to push a lot of government at that point, and we're reassured that we shouldn't worry too much because the U.S. government is coming to save key population around the world and that we were happy about. In Durban, an official announcement was made, and we told that in Amsterdam, we're gonna know exactly who is getting that funds. We got here, we got different news. And from the statement that was released yesterday, stating that we are still awaiting congressional approval, and again, another statement came out saying that the, the, the funds is going to USAID and CDC, which is just- And DOD. DOD, which should be just another linkages or just nope. another program. What we want is, before the conference end, we want a community advisory board for KPIF. Well, that's a great idea. We want that. And, and we're I ready to we fund can do it that. and support it. I think we can do that. We don't need to fund it. We can figure this out. Yes. But the, I just want to say one thing. The money is still there. It has not disappeared. And it's still committed solely to indigenous populations for peer-to-peer -peer service delivery. So. It's my fault, because I couldn't get the money to move the way it needed to move. It was going to take another seven months, and I just couldn't wait another seven months. So it is not going to go out through large, complex organizations. We are going to figure out how to get it on the ground, because so that was my commitment. We'll do that. Okay. We'll do that. Send me what you want, though. BerksDL at state.gov. Let's not forget the women. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I think you know that I'm not a person that delivers good statements. I'm a person that gets onto the ground and makes it happen. What I'm telling you is I failed to make it happen despite two years of very aggressive work because I was trying to make a bureaucracy bow to my wishes. Uh, I wasn't willing to keep that going just to win that fight. So I decided we should do it the traditional way, but not the traditional individuals and, and groups, but the, the peer groups. So give us a chance. I Look, the last two years, on me. So don't carry that over to the next group who's really going to try very hard to do this right and get it to the right people. We want to be part of the next group. Okay. You want to be part of the next Send group. me the names. Yes. Burks, DL, at state.gov. I do answer my own emails. Okay. Get into me. Great. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Okay, perfect. So, and I did try in the Jonathan Mann lecture to make it clear where we were failing um, at a global community and where we were failing at PEPFAR to really reach the people we needed to reach. And I think in key populations everywhere in West and West Central Africa, we have a serious situation. We also have a serious situation with young women, and I, this is just one slide of many that shows identical the same thing. At every different age band, all the way up to 35, young women girls and adolescents and young women have prevalences that far exceed any of the men. And I think in the recent Nibia data, you see exactly the same picture. <coughs> now, we know that the risk is incredibly greater, and DREAMS was launched to really address this issue. But at the same time, and we kept the funding very separate because we wanted to make it very clear our dedication to on-the-ground work with young women, we put a lot of additional money into finding young men. We are concerned about particularly young women on the move and the amount of urbanization that is happening as well as the youth wave. And young women coming into um, informal settlements in major cities like Johannesburg, Durban, Nairobi, Lusaka, and I'll show you some of the DREAMS data from that. This is the youth wave, and I call it a youth wave. It is a youth bulge in Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, Swaziland. It's a bulge that's moving through and then there's a smaller group underneath it. In Zambia and the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, it looks like this. So for the next 30 years, we will have <coughs> this wave of individuals moving through the age of sexual debut. You all know about the cycle of new infections, and it always is interesting to me. People always ask me about the boys and men. I'll remind everybody, our boys and men program started in 2009 when we started expanding circumcision and prevention for young boys and young men. Um, that has been very successful, and we're up to 15 million circumcisions. DREAMS was launched specifically <coughs> for young women, but our big gap is still over here in the 25 to 35-year-old men, and that's why we launched MedStar, MenStar to really find men in that age group. I think you've seen this data. It highlights the number of young people who are unaware of their status and therefore don't have the opportunity to be virally suppressed. And I want to make that very clear. It's not that young people are not taking their drugs. It's that they don't know that they're HIV positive. And you can see particularly young men, this is all the FIAs from seven countries taken together across sub primarily Eastern and Southern Africa, and less than 40% are virally <coughs> suppressed. Most of it do because they do not know their diagnosis. Young women, particularly children under 14, and young women are the group um, among females. So you know it stands for Determined, Resilient, Empowered, AIDS, Free, Mentored, and Safe, and now we'll get into the data. The important piece about this program, it was planned from the ground up, and to this day, DREAMS ambassadors and DREAMS recipients meet with me personally and tell me how these programs are working on the ground, and I have some insights from that also. What has been incredibly helpful is the girl roster and the groups that have used the girl roster, and I hope you all look at that. It's from the POP Council. They have been very helpful in trying to identify the most vulnerable girls and really finding and reaching. It's a very similar issue to what we have in key populations, getting into the net networks of the highest vulnerability to really ensure prevention and treatment services are reaching those individuals. Because you can easily 
reach those who are easy to reach. And that should not give us any reassurance. Um, it, when it happens in our key population networks, we end up with prevalences of less than one. To me, that means that we haven't gotten into the right network. So many of the groups have used the GIRL roster. Um, it really is a good demographic tool, I'm putting that in parentheses, to really define the number of girls in that community and then characterize the risk factors in those girls. So this is what the enumeration looks like um, in one of the Kenyan wards. So these are the households, the number of girls, and this allows us to know both the numerator and the denominator. Really important to know the denominator. Because when we reach 500 girls or 1,000 girls, is that 1%? Is that 5%? Is it 50%? And the reason this is very important is trying to identify those number of girls who are what we would term off track. These are out of school girls. These are living with neither parent, already married, or a combination. And you can really see in these two different communities, very different. So you have to know what is happening in your specific community so that you can tailor programs specifically for those girls. So what were our findings? Well, we reached 2.5 million girls, but the important thing is, is we also have the stories capturing the information girl by girl to really make sure that they can see themselves in the solutions of the program. You know that for the first time we took a structural intervention approach we didn't layer in PrEP until about a year and a half ago. It was solely primary prevention using structural interventions, and we had a dramatic impact in insulin incidence in just 13 months. You've seen the district slides, so we had some countries, Mozambique and Malawi, where 100% of the districts had a more than 25% response, and in many of the places had the largest response. I met with um, girls from Mozambique recently, just a few days ago, and asked them, what is going on in Mozambique? And they were like, it is so convenient for us. All of the structural interventions are in one place so we can reach them. And this was in contrast from um, a young woman from South Africa who said, we have nine different interventions available to us, nine different partners, nine different places, and nine different places where we're needing to go. We can't do that. So this layering piece is, becomes to be very important. Each of the districts have been identified the line is at 25%, so you can see the number of districts that are well over 25%, and these are the ones that are less than 25%. The dark reds are highly urbanized areas. Nairobi, Mbeya City, Lusaka, Johannesburg. And so where we are failing are in these highly urban areas. And when you look at the percent of districts and the response, Districts that primarily the urban districts are in the less than 25% um, decreasing incidence. And what also we found is full coverage of services is absolutely key. So it's very difficult to have full coverage of services in a city like Lusaka. And I think that is really our challenge before us because we've shown that in a saturated way, when you provide the combination of structural interventions of keeping girls in school, ensuring there's nutritional access, working with the communities, working with the families, you get a very excellent outcome. But then how do you take that to scale in a city, a large city, a city of may have many informal settlements? This was the duration of implementation. That did not determine whether we had a significant decline in incidence or not. We sent our teams into the field um, to work with the partners and hear from the partners and hear from the girls. These are the things that they found that were associated with success. Teams that use standardized tools so that they could learn from each other and share data directly. So implementing partners that had standardized tools at each of the districts. Evidence of strong layering. Not enough to check a box, but to actually engage with that girl, adolescent girl or young woman and really see whether they were able to and continue to receive the layering. Peers, peer outreach was critically important and that's what the KPIF is to be. Peer-to-peer -peer service delivery and outreach, that was also critically important. 
community buy-in, meet meeting with the local leaders, having the local leaders take ownership of being a Dreams Girl district, and then strong coordination. So we're trying to decide where to take Dreams. We're still funding it. It's still we're sitting putting about two hundred million dollars a year in this. Um, but we're trying to utilize the data to really address the needs. And the gap that we are seeing in, in district after district is this level of frank rape that's occurring in these communities and has been found to be um, passively acceptable. And so this is really our challenge. We believe that girls in informal settlements are even more susceptible to rape. But what was important... That was just first sex rape. This is how much sexual violence just in the last 12 months. And you can see across the board, all the numbers go up. And so this is a constant experience in young girls' lives where 30 to 40 percent are, are constantly experiencing sexual violence. So we've tried to bring our Orphans and Vulnerable Children's program in. It's about $300 million program to be in complementary with our Greens Dreams program to try to ensure that 9- to 14-year-old girls are protected before the age of sexual debut to decrease the amount of rape in the community. So I'm going to stop there so that you have time for all the rest of the groups and see if quickly um, there are questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions from everybody? Okay. Noted at the back. Please Hi, go John ahead. John Stover from Avenue Health. Uh, thank you. That's, it's great to be seeing the, uh, the effectiveness of the program. I wonder if you could say a word about how you measured the incidence decline. So these measurements, is this on or you can hear me? These measurements were done um, in a very straightforward way. Um, we have been collecting um, baseline data at each of these districts, pregnancy under 20 and zero status. So these are new diagnoses of what you could consider incident cases in women under 20 um, in that district. So not selected for whether they reached a DREAMS program or not, just all of those young women um, baseline and follow-up. We do, of course, have the surveys in the field, and we have moved recency tests into all of these areas to be able to detect um, new infections and do a direct comparator. So these are um, district-wide, and that's why if you didn't get full coverage in a district, it was very difficult then to see significant declines in incidence. You can go ahead. Thank you. Um, so it's a follow-up question, actually. Cause, so given that, it feels quite dangerous to be talking about reductions in incidence when what you're talking about is in prevalent infections in pregnant, young pregnant women. And I think it's actually all pregnant women, isn't it? No, it's, young it's pregnant, pregnant women, pregnant. first okay. pregnancy. So, so we use that as a surrogate in our pre prevalence assays all of the time. In other words, when you look at our survey data, you can see a low, a low grade prevalence in zero to 14 year olds that's very persistent through all of the age groups. And then you see rapid increase in prevalence. Yes, we are using that delta as a surrogate. And because we already had 100% pre penetrance, the reason this works is because PMTCT access is over 95% in these districts. So if it wasn't, I would agree with you completely. But since we already had 12 years of baseline PMDCT data at a, over at least the last five years at 95 plus percent or greater, then we can do that historical comparator. So just one quick comment, but just of course, I mean, these young women are pregnant. So I mean, one thing that you might be doing is underestimating what's going, if dreams has the impact of, yes. but, but more generally, it just yes. feels like you need, one needs to be quite careful about using those. Well, those, that's why we're that doing in incident that. assays, right. but it took, you know how protocols go. Took us a while to get those recency assays out there, but they're fully in the field now. Thanks, Catherine Kripke from Avenir Health. And um, I'm interested in the tool that was used to select the at-risk women and also how you can get um, estimates of the size of the population of those who are gonna qualify. Yeah, so do we have someone from Pop Council on, here in the room? Because I don't wanna describe their tool incorrectly, the girl roster tool. Our POP Council colleagues. Could, could you speak to the population size estimate, even if you can't speak to the tool? Can you? <laughs> She's moving. Come to a microphone. She seems reluctant. Mm. Uh, hi, Ambassador Burks. How are you? 
Um, I can t say a little bit about the girl yeah. roster, but as you know, it's not. I know. Part You're of the, the tool researcher. Yes, the research uh, part. The girl, the girl roster is a programmatic tool that the individual partners, some of the individual dreams partners, are using in their communities to actually map out the households as well as identify. They're actually identifying the sample of girls, and they're asking a series of non-sensitive questions to try to see who, which girls are off track. What we've learned from the implementation science data, that's the portfolio that I lead, is that the partners then use that data to do additional screening to identify girls that are in risk. Usually that screening criteria is based on local, locally defined risk factors, whether it's orphan households, whether it's girls who are out of school. So it, it, there's a, a, usually additional layers. With, uh, so just to reiterate, the girl roster again is a programmatic tool to try to understand the landscape because as you know very well, there's the there's limited census data in many of the communities, so you often don't know the denominators of girls that are in the study sites. I hope. Yes, that was perfect. <laughs> I mean, just remember all of our surveys are based on the country's census data, um, all of the BIAs, yes. Hi, Ambassador Burks. I'm Kim Nichols from African Services Committee in New York. I know I'm very interested in knowing what you mean by indigenous indigenous organizations when you talk about the reissue of the KPIF, RFA, or, or however you're going to do it. I mean, there are also many diaspora organizations, indigenous diaspora organizations. So I think many of us, and we're not the only one, but I think there are others who've put in, you know, bids through the process in a very, you know, formulaic way. And now we're very concerned about what happens in the selection. So it, we want to know that it's going to be fair and and, yeah, and so um, let me be clear about there's a definition on our website of indigenous organizations because it gets quite complicated. Um, and it has to do with the formation of the board, the board members, um, the proponents, the number of. It's very clear because we've had the opposite to what you described. Um, and I just, um, we've had organizations that had indigenous perceptional indigenous in the perception but not in the reality and so I think we're very serious about truly indigenous organizations. Okay in the interest of time uh, we need to move on. I want to thank the ambassador for her presentation and also for answering those additional questions so we're going to let you go. Thank we could you. give a round of applause. <clears throat> There are some seats at the front, so if people want to come round, there's, in fact, there are plenty of seats um, in the middle at the front. So I'm very pleased. Uh, the ambassador was talking about fears, population HIV in, uh, impact assessments. I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Radin. Um, she is the technical director for the FEAR project at ICAP, that's the Columbia University. And she's also a lecturer in the Department of Epidemiology at the Melbourne School of Public Health. Elizabeth, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, I drew the short lot in the speaker lineup. Ambassador Burks is an incredibly tough act to follow, but I'll, I'll forge ahead with what does population data tell us about programming priorities. So why are we doing population surveys in the first place? Well, facility-based data includes only a subset of the population and a subset that's biased towards the people who are getting care and treatment. Um, however, for our programming, we need to identify population measures such as prevalence, incidence, and viral load suppression, particularly the latter two. Uh, and that's very difficult to, per to infer from that biased uh, subset of facility-based data. We do have modeled estimates, uh, but those models are difficult to parameterize with facility-based data alone, and in fact, we've seen that the population data has been helpful in updating some of those models. Uh, we're carrying out the FIA population-based HIV impact assessments in 14 countries in Africa. As of yesterday, we've released results for 11 countries shown here in purple. Our primary objectives are to measure national HIV incidence and prevalence of viral load suppression at a subnational level. We have a range of secondary objectives which differ somewhat by country, uh, but, but mostly include adult and pediatric HIV prevalence, drug resistance, presence of detectable ARVs, and CD4, among others. Uh, this is a standard cross-sectional, two-stage clustered-based uh, approach 
We have a sample size of about 30,000 participants per country. Our questionnaires are asked to the household, to adult members, as well as to adolescents 10 to 14 years old and include demographic, behavioral, and clinical information. We capture data electronically, which allows us to upload and monitor it. Uh, and of course, the results are weighted for survey design, non-response, and non-coverage, so they are in fact nationally representative. In terms of the biomarker testing, we draw venous blood at the household level and conduct HIV rapid testing according to each national algorithm. We also do a point of care CD4 testing for HIV positives with all results returned uh, on the spot at the household. In our satellite laboratories, we do uh, confirmatory and quality assurance testing, and at our central lab level, virological testing for HIV viral load, as well as early infant diagnosis, as well as a recency assay, which the ambassador just mentioned, to, that allows us to estimate recency nationally. And again, all results, even those done at the satellite lab, are returned to the participant or their health provider. So getting to the interesting part, what does the data tell us about programming? I framed this in terms of myths that we can bust, so things that we thought were true that needed to guide our programming. Uh, and in fact, the population level data has given us a, a different interpretation of what's happening. So the first myth was that the main challenge in African countries would be in achieving the second and third 90s, similar to the situation in the US. At the right here, you see the 20, 2014 uh, 90-90-90 cascade for adults in the United States showing 85% of people diagnosed and somewhat lower achievement, 73% on treatment and 79% virally suppressed. As you've probably heard at this conference um, in the, the U.S., in the African countries we've studied, and here's 11 countries, we see consistently a different pattern of the biggest gap being in the first 90 in awareness of status and diagnosis. And this holds from uh, our countries which are very close to, to achieving the 90-90-90s, uh, where there's maybe a four or five percentage point gap in the first 90 if you look at East Watini and Namibia, uh, two countries that have quite a bit more room for progress, such as Cameroon and, and Cote d'Ivoire. Another myth was that men will lag behind women on all three 90s, so men are are less likely to be aware of their status, but also more difficult to initiate on, on ARRT uh, and less likely to be virally suppressed. And what we found in terms of the first 90 is uh, that men, in fact, do lag women. Uh, this is by about six to eight percentage points in most of the higher prevalent Southern African countries we've looked at, going all the way up to uh, an almost 50% difference, 20 percentage points in, in Cote d'Ivoire, so a significant gap. And you've heard about the MenStar program at this conference aiming to uh, help access and, and provide testing services to some of these missed men. However, once aware, men and women are similarly likely to be on ART in most contexts. Um, for our first nine countries, we see barely a couple percentage points difference between men and women on ART, men shown here in green and with the women in lavender. Um, the exception to this is Cote d'Ivoire, where there does seem to be a different pattern, and, and that's a signal. Um, the population data allows us to steer not just by issue, but also by country where context may differ, and in fact, Cote d'Ivoire may be a good candidate for some of those um, differentiated interventions for uh, making ART more accessible and, and appealing. Um, once on ART, men and women are also similarly likely to be virally suppressed. Again, we see that those just a couple percentage point gap in our first nine countries with Cote d'Ivoire all the way on the right-hand side standing out for a larger gap. Um, again, new strategies being developed there to reach out uh, to, to both groups, but, but particularly to the men, uh, and another good place to think about differentiated service delivery. Um, another myth was thinking about as people are surviving and people living with HIV are getting older, there's a concern that older adults will not do well on ART because of comorbidities and, and polypharmacy. Um, and in fact, what we see is very much the opposite data from seven countries here showing the over 50 age group having viral load suppression. Among those on, on ART, viral load suppression was over uh, 90 percent in, in most of these countries, approaching 90 percent in Uganda. Um, another consideration is what are our, what do our rates of loss to follow-up look like? 
And we had reason to believe these are exceptionally high, and, and indeed they may be on a, a very localized level with some facility-based data analyses as well as uh, community and district level studies suggesting loss to follow up up to uh, even 40 and 50 percent. Now, if we look at the population from the surveys who are aware of their status, and that's not exactly the same thing of being in care, so this is a slightly more conservative way to look at it, but if we look among people aware of their status and look at the percent who are virally suppressed, so this is the second 90 times the third 90, um, we actually see that that's at or over 80 percent in many cases, uh, a few percentage points behind that in a couple places, again, um, a bit lower in, in Cote d'Ivoire and, and some you know, more intensive engagement activities needed there, certainly. Um, this suggests to us that silent transfers, which is an incredibly difficult thing to track at the facility level, may be playing a role. Uh, of course, we also acknowledge that one thing we can account for in this population data is if people have been lost to follow up and, and died. Um, so that's another consideration to explore as we're getting finer measures of, of mortality. Um, another idea was that most undiagnosed PLHIV are at relatively early stages of disease progression, so younger people who are asymptomatic. And what we see here when we look at the population data is that in Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, 48% of undiagnosed PLHIV had CD4 below 350. So those are PLHIV who told us in the survey they believe themselves to be HIV negative, and then we in the study found them to be HIV positive. We're assuming that they were previously undiagnosed as they self-reported to us, um, and nearly half of those already with CD4 below 350. So the blue bars here are showing us um, the percentages of PLHIV who are already meeting that late diagnosis criteria, relatively similar across the countries, somewhat higher among men, and certainly increasing uh, as we go towards the older age groups. The red triangles are showing the number, so the burden of undiagnosed PLHIV with CD4 under 350. Um, somewhat higher here in, in Zimbabwe, largely due to the higher prevalence there, about equal among men and women. So. Um, the total number is th just over 370,000 PLHIV who are undiagnosed, who have that low CD4 count, um, about 180,000 each for men and women. Uh, and then finally, the burden highest in that 25 to 40-year-old age group, though also significantly high in the over 40 age group. So that's a, a vulnerable, um, somewhat older population who's somehow slipped through the cracks, um, hasn't been diagnosed, but is at risk for uh, morbidity, mortality, and also disease transmission. Um, and then the last myth is, is one that my colleague spoke to yesterday in the morning session on pediatrics. Uh, the, there was a, a question whether the burden of children living with HIV was in fact overestimated, and pediatric treatment coverage was really quite high, um, that we were underestimating pediatric treatment coverage and how many children were left to be found. Uh, this is an analysis done by my colleague Suzue Saito, uh, along with colleagues <coughs> from PEPFAR and UNAIDS, um, comparing the burden of children living with HIV as estimated by FIA population level data to the spectrum modeled estimates. And indeed, we see here that um, the only country that really had a, a substantial number of difference, and it's, it's not huge in percentage terms, was Tanzania. Um, in Malawi, the difference was that FIA actually found that to be quite a bit higher, um, but not supporting the idea that the number of children living with HIV was vastly overestimated. Uh, as a result, we see that AL ART coverage among children living with HIV is still alarmingly low in several countries. The uh, study team found that on average among these seven countries, the coverage gap was uh, in the 40 percent, nearly nearly 50 percent. Um, here we have the, the FIA data in uh, dark green spectrum and medium green and, and PEPFAR in the light green, um, but consistently showing us that, that that gap is still there and that's an area for, for continued progress and focus. So in terms of summaries and conclusions, we know the focus is needed on the first 90 on awareness of status. Uh, we see that men may be harder to diagnose, but do equally well getting on and staying on treatment in most contexts. Uh, loss to follow-up may not be as high as we thought. 
there is an older population at risk for morbidity, mortality, and transmission due to late diagnosis. Uh, and lastly, that the modeled estimates for children living with HIV have been fairly accurate and the treatment gap remains high in children. Would like to thank all the partners that have allowed us this that have allowed us to collect this data. It's based on over 300,000 survey participants across those countries. So this was a major effort with ministries of health, CDC, my colleagues at ICAP at Columbia, PEPFAR, and all the members of the study team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, re really interesting talk. Just to remind, remind everybody, please write your questions down. We're going to take questions at the end. If anyone has an absolutely burning question, then we'll take it. But ideally, we will take questions at the end after we've heard all the speakers in the interest of fairness and diplomacy and yeah. <laughs> democracy. There you go. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, our next speaker is from Tanzania, Dr. Jerem Shiner, who is a senior research scientist. Um, he's based at the National Institute for Medical Research in Mwanza. Um, he's a medical anthropologist with more than 19 years research experience on many issues, but most um, important here is adolescent sexual and reproductive health and the socio-cultural aspects of HIV and AIDS. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to move away a little bit from the survey data and share findings from a study we conducted in three countries, uh, in Tanzania, South Africa, and India. On, the uh, on alcohol availability to youth. This work was carried out under the STRIVE Consortia, which addresses the structural drivers of HIV, including uh, violence. So we've just presented uh, results from a trial that we, da we did in Mwanza uh, on violence uh, to women uh, receiving microfinance. So this is another sort of set of studies that we're conducting. So I'm pre presenting this on behalf of my colleagues. As we know, alcohol use is one of the drivers of HIV risk, and it has been linked to uh, several uh, proximal uh, risks of HIV, multiple partnerships, and protected sex in con uh, condom use and transactional sex. It's also linked to negative treatment outcomes, in uh, including poor adherence to ART, and also dis uh, poor disease progression. In this study, uh, which we carried out in three countries, as I said, in Tanzania we had two sites, uh, in Mwanza on the southern shores of Lake Victoria and in Kilimanjaro near the mountain. And in South Africa we had two sites, Gauteng and Mpumalanga provinces. And in India we carried out the study in uh, Mumbai, but in, in uh, th uh, three areas of the, of the city. We had three objectives, and the main one was to document the availability uh, the pricing, packaging, and advertising, and marketing on, of alcohol to this population of young people, but also to explore their perception of, of the availability and also the advertisement that they see every day within their uh, settings, and also to explore drinking patterns, norms, and risky behavior, including sexual violence. We used uh, three main methods. So we, we mapped, we used mapping, uh, as our main sort of method, uh, and also we use photo voices and group discussions, qualitative group discussions. So just to point out that this, this, this data was collected by young people, so we made sure that in, uh, in all the three sites, we recruited young researchers to do the, the mapping, so they were trained for a week uh, in terms of mapping, but also for the photo voices, we recruited young people from different groups in the, uh, in the, in the study areas uh, aged 18 to 24. Uh, in terms of mapping, we mapped uh, alcohol outlets and advertisements which are ne were near uh, educational institutions. In Tanzania it and South Africa, it was uh, schools, uh, secondary and prim primary schools. And in India, we mapped uh, advertisements and outlets near uh, colleges. Uh, during data collection, the, the research team familiarized itself with the area, 
uh, by walking, taking transit walks, and also later on they collected data by mapping all the schools in the in the in the, in the study areas, but also all the alcohol selling outlets, and also the the advertisements. They record other information uh, of the outlets and also photographs the adverts that were on on the on the on the outlets, but also on the banners that were in within the the study areas. Uh, these were later uh, discussed during group discussions. Uh, we had uh, four group discussions in each country, two for females and two for males, for the two sites in each country. And also we used uh, Atlas and, and Envivo for qualitative data analysis. So in terms of the findings, we can see here a map of Mwanza, the study area. And you can see that uh, you have the red stars. The red stars, they show the schools in this area, and uh, the blue boxes are the alcohol outlets that are within within the area, study area, and also the the white boxes are the advertisements, and we've put rings around the school uh, of a 500 meter buffer, which is required by most of the uh, regulations in the countries that we, there should be, be alcohol being sold in these areas or uh, any advertisement or alcohol. So this was the case for, for the other site in, in, in Kilimanjaro. In South Africa, this is a map from one of our sites, uh, urban site. As you can see, uh, the, we have now uh, the schools are shown in yellow, yellow stars. And you can see the tavern, pubs, and bars, and bottle stores in red uh, stars. They are sort of all over the place, and also the the blue boxes represent the or show the the adverts. And again, we've we've, we've sort of marked the 500 meter buffer around the the schools. And in South Africa, just to say that there is a specific law which bars uh, alcohol uh, outlets and advertisements within 500 meters of schools. This map is from India. Uh, from the uh, from east, west, and southern uh, Mumbai, and again you can see uh, the colleges marked in red stars, and uh, liquor shops in blue boxes. Again, a similar story. So you find dotted lines within the 500 bar. So this was a quite a sort of powerful display of how actually. Uh, policies or uh, they're violated uh, in, 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 in practice. Then after, as I said, we took the groups, the, the young people through discussions, they discussed uh, uh, what do they make of the advertisement that they see. So most of them reported that they find them very attractive. They have these pictures which are quite attractive, as you can see there, a quotation. Uh, just by looking at the image of this alcohol, you feel like trying it. This is a participant uh, from South Africa. And the promotion is done linking the, the, the advertisement, and the advertisement is done of competitions, celebrity events, and the events, and so on, and promotional hours and days. These are advertisements uh, photographed in Tanzania by our team of young people, again emphasizing on the affordability of alcohol and also uh, communicating notions of masculinity. So if you're a boy, you know, you want to drink, and you want to drink a lot. Advertisement is illegal in India. So most of, from our discussion there, uh, young people said they access uh, advertisement, or they get advertisement through the internet, either through their phones or uh, computers. But also there are examples on, on the left I think it should be on the left uh, bottom of, your, of the screen. You see the picture there of, of alcohol being advertised and near a college, despite that it's not allowed. So this was captured in Mumbai. Also, other messages that young people made of the whole issue of alcohol in terms of the, the availability and the messaging that young people should, it encourages them to, to take a lot of alcohol, to binge. And also, they related alcohol to sexual risk, violence, and transactional sex. There are reports that uh, alcohol is exchanged uh, for sex uh, by young women uh, with older male. 
but this is a very common practice, especially came out strongly in South Africa, and also related to sexual violence amongst themselves, young people, but also from older males. They also uh, reported unprotected and unplanned and regretted sexual acts, which came after uh, indulging in this drinking uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> practices. And this is a picture from India, from one of our participants depicting uh, alcohol, <coughs> uh, uh, violence uh, from alcohol. So we have several recommendations from our study. First of all, we see that uh, you, know, you can use innovative or quite interesting methods like mapping, photo voice, and, and group discussion uh, to, to really capture a problem that uh, uh, faces young people. In this case, it's alcohol use. Number two, you can, you can use really young people. Young people are able to, to collect the data, they are able to engage with the data, they are able to analyze and present the data in a meaningful way through the discussions uh, with facilitations for, from researchers. We see that from the evidence that we've, uh, we've shown uh, that uh, we need stronger policies and programs, need to work together uh, with policymakers in order to, to, to protect uh, vulnerable groups, especially young people, to create space, uh, safe spaces like schools. So schools are supposed to be safe spaces free of alcohol, but then we see what was happening from the maps that we, we, should, we just saw. saw. Uh, and then we, we also, in, in our, after our study, we used some of these, these maps to, to engage sorry, policy makers Jerry, sorry, during discussion. Jerry, if you could wrap up now, please. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So these will provide a very strong tool for engaging policymakers, where you can display that actually there's violation, clear violation of the policies that are in place. And lastly, we need interventions at the structural level to control availability of alcohol and also in terms of advertisement, which targets young people. We've seen that the alcohol companies, they are looking at the developing countries as new uh, markets and they're looking at young people as new markets. So really, we should be able to address those if we want to address the proximal also risk factors uh, for HIV, transactional sex, and safe sex, and sexual violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. In the interest of time, I'm going to introduce our next speaker from Kenya. I must get this right. Parinita. Very good. <laughs> That's um, Parinita has a career spanning over 22 years in social development across multiple sectors like HIV and AIDS, reproductive health, gender, and violence. Over to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, my talk is focusing on delivering sex worker programs at scale. Uh, what data do we need? And I'm going to be speaking from our experience of my experience of implementing Avahan in India and now in Kenya, sex work interventions in Kenya with Ministry of Health. The presentation is also largely focused on female sex workers, and that's the, kind, that's the data that I'm going to share. I'm not going to talk, in, to talk too much about uh, key populations. I think we've heard throughout this conference that if we do not scale up programs with key populations, which includes sex workers, we're not going to have impact on the epidemic. Based on some of our experiences of scaling up, uh, the principles of scaling up, uh, we believe is that for scaling up sex worker program, we need to establish a denominator, and we heard it in our dreams presentation too. Scale up needs to be simultaneous. It, it has to focus on coverage. You can, we cannot have small pilots and, and, and not talk about coverage. They, we need to have a basic standard of program, but there needs to be also flexibility to understand and, and address contextual needs. Listening to community and focusing on community ownership is very, very important, and that's what we have learned in our scale up of sex work programs. Generating evidence uh, data uh, in the context of program, but also using them by the people who are implementing programs is very essential if we have to focus on scale up. In terms of establishing a denominator, uh, we talk about mapping and estimation. There are various methods of mapping and estimation. Uh, but what's important is that we understand how many, but we also understand where are they. And also certain 
understanding of certain sexual structures, what's the typology of sex work. And if mapping and estimation don't have these three features, then it becomes very difficult for implementing programs and scaling up programs. Mapping can be used for macro level planning, but also micro level. So mapping data and estimation data at the national level provides understanding of where to prioritize programs, but also for resourcing and monitoring. So this is data from Karnataka state in India. After mapping, we fig figured out where should we prioritize, which geography should we prioritize. If we, we figured out that if we cover around 20 districts out of 30 districts, we're actually reaching 90% of, uh, of sex workers, and we should put our resources and our intervention in those districts. Similarly, for micro level understanding, we need to understand where are the hotspots, how many sex workers are in the hotspots, but also what's the typology. Uh, again, the data from India where we found that in that particular city, most of the typology of sex worker was street based and home based. So, our outreach configuration and our selection of outreach worker selection of peer educators will be based on some of these understanding. Obviously, uh, now hotspot-based sex work has moved to mobile-based, web-based sex work, sex work, and there's a lot of uh, experimentation that's happening with web-based ma mapping and to understand how many sex workers who solicit through uh, web and to reach them. While uh, mapping uh, is done and mapping data is available, it's only useful if communities and sex workers and programs use it. So numbers are fine, but how do we use these numbers to actually program is important. And mapping doesn't have to be very complicated. While we can do uh, geographic mapping and program mapping at a larger scale, at the community level, at the program level, peer educators, outreach workers can also validate mapping using very simple tools, and that helps in ownership and scale up of programs. While we mapped, we set up programs, we have to also monitor programs. And there are various indicators, and I'm not going to talk about indicators of measuring and monitoring, really. But I would like to emphasize that in a sex work program, we do have to monitor behavioral, biomedical, and structural interventions. It's just not enough to develop care cascades. We have to talk about and monitor all the aspects of a comprehensive uh, program. Here is some data from Kenya on behavioral outputs. And Kenya, at the national level, county level, and implementing partner level, we monitor some of these indicators like contact, how, peer contact of uh, sex workers, how many condoms they have received as per their, have they received as per their need or not. Uh, peer ratio, peer educator and peer educator and peer ratio is very important. If you have a very high ratio, if one peer educator manages 100, 200 uh, sex workers, this is not never going to do an intensive outreach and uh, and reach the scale or coverage that that is needed. Uh, and testing. So there are many other indicators which is uh, measured at a quarterly, quarterly level uh, in Kenya, at the national level, but also at the county and the implementation partner level. Some example of measuring violence. So two indicators that we measure in Kenya is uh, violence reported and violence addressed as a, as, as a way of uh, monitoring structural interventions. Uh, this is a crisis tool, a violence monitoring tool from India, which is a pictorial tool. Uh, in India, most of our peer educators were semi-literate. So using simple tools to, uh, uh, to actually monitor programs, record and report on, on programs. And some of this data has been used very successfully to actually advocate for a stronger violence response and prevention program. We also do process monitoring, and sometimes we forget to document uh, and talk about this little bit, a little bit. We have peer educators meeting, which happens every month. We look at the data which is developed through these uh, uh, formal monitoring processes and discuss with our outreach team and the clinic team and look at gaps. And this process monitoring also helps in uh, looking at coverage, acceptability, but also core program and what's the emerging needs uh, that's coming up from uh, from the community that and how our program need to be uh, refined to address those needs. Monitoring at the peer educator level is very important, again, for uh, looking at scale and coverage, using simple tools like opportunity gap analysis, where a peer educator sits with her uh, cohort of uh, sex workers that she reaches or he reaches and talks about how many have she contacted, how many have come to the clinic, how many have actually tested or treated. It's almost like the prevention cascade or the care cascade or the cascade that we're talking about, but in a much more simplistic way for her planning and for her accountability to the community that she is responsible for. We 
also need to measure outcomes, and uh, outcomes are at the level of incidence or prevalence, but also certain behaviors. Uh, normally, uh, programs use surveys uh, two years, three years, or four years apart to measure outcomes. I'm going to also talk about a simple tool called polling booth surveys that we have used to measure outcomes. It's a group uh, uh, survey method, and it uh, helps in actually increasing a sense of confidentiality among participants and gives good answers or, or, or good responses or uh, to social dis issues around social desirability like condom use. Uh, I think the exciting part of it is very quick. It, uh, you, we get data within, uh, within two months uh, across different sites. And this is done by sex workers themselves as researchers. And I think that builds a lot of ownership and also help them understand how the program is performing. This data from uh, India uh, on condom use by partnerships, which helped us over a period of time to understand uh, whether, whether sex workers are using condoms or not, but also which are the partners that they're having most difficulty with and where we need to uh, emphasize or, or build skills. The other slide is from uh, Kenya on, on, on care uh, uh, to help us understand, again, how many sex workers, what proportion of sex workers are on care vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis positivity, uh, but also uh, uh, differentiating between different counties, which counties need more support, which counties have done a very, very good job, and how do we learn from uh, there? So to prioritize interventions. Uh, again, data on uh, on violence. Uh, this can be also collected through our outcome studies. Uh, this data is on police violence. While uh, our data shows that police violence has been stable, but it's 48 percent, which is like 50 percent, half of our sex workers experience police violence. And that is very serious. And that data has helped us to develop policy documents, training manuals, and strengthen police uh, uh, and violence prevention programs. Data that we generate from either monitoring and uh, uh, from output data can be also used to model impact. And this is an example of Belgaum for the Avahan program, which talk, which talk about how, what's the impact of interven interventions. I also wanted to emphasize that a lot of our programs, sex work programs, do research. And how do we use research data to actually prioritize and to, and to scale up? This is a study from Mombasa, a transition study, where we found that uh, when we compared HIV prevalence in the same age group between sex workers and non-sex workers, it was much higher among sex workers. But we also found that one out of every five sex worker is already positive by the time she reaches 24. Uh, so it emphasized the need to start programs much earlier. Uh, if you see at 14 to 16, 6 percent are already positive. So I mean, how low should we go uh, in terms of the age? And uh, a lot of our programs actually focus on 18 years and above. So are we, uh, are we actually doing an HIV prevention program for sex workers or HIV prevention program for general population, really? Uh, the other one is a, data, a, a study called Transform Study from Nairobi, which for the first time showed in Kenya that that transgender populations are at very high risk because they're very high HIV prevalence. And this is the data that we are using now to advocate for including transgender as key populations in the Kenya strategic uh, plan, the next Kenya strategic plan. My last slide. Uh, in terms of learning, we all know data is important to scale up, uh, scale up programs. It helps us to keep in track. Uh, Simple tools are available, standard tools are available, which where we can collect data uh, at high frequency and can be managed and owned by uh, sex workers themselves. While collecting data, it's important to understand what is essential and what's desirable. And I feel we collect a lot of data and we don't use it. And data uh, is only uh, useful if we can use it for programming, uh, not necessarily always to uh, do analysis and present. Engagement of sex workers is very, very important because if you do, they don't have ownership of it, and then they, there is no point thinking about scaling up because uh, they're the one who is going to scale up our program. And data collection is not about finding gaps. It's also about finding solutions. How do we improve our program? It's not about closing programs. It's about how do we strengthen them to make, make it better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Parinata, particularly on emphasizing that data is only useful if it's used. And I really like the way that you in included sex workers in, in the collection of that data. So I'm sure there'll be questions on that when we, when we come to the, the discussion se section. So the final speaker, Professor Jeff Garnett, <laughs> who uh, many of you will know, 
Jeff works for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Okay, thank you. So when it came to thinking about what I was going to say this evening, I thought, what's an idiot? Why did you say yes? What are you going to talk about? And started looking for examples of things to talk about. And it turns out there's actually far more than I could possibly cover. So I'm just going to give you some examples of where, the way data and technology is being combined uh, to, to make programming better, but also talk about some of the challenges around that, that data and precision programming. But before I do that, I do want to, to make a couple of, uh, of points that I think because there is a real tension between our ability to track, link uh, people and patients to provide them pub public services to help them versus our ability to track and trace and monitor patients and people to do them harm. You can't always assume that the public health providers are going to be benign. And, and so we have to be really careful when we're thinking about data collection and the use of technologies that actually we have the benefit of the populations that are receiving the, uh, the services at heart. And we also protect that data from people that would do them harm. So I think, think in thinking about how we as programs use data, we have to, to really earn the trust of the populations uh, that we're working with. Second uh, general point is that, that we can use technologies to make testing, treatment and prevention easier. Uh, and that's what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming to make the lives of, of both the service providers and the patients easier. Uh, we can use safer and better tolerated drugs, which is a new technology, uh, which means that we perhaps need to monitor patients less because maybe they'll be doing well uh, with uh, suppressed viral loads. We can be more discreet in our, our use of services. So we can use HIV self-screening tools so people can test uh, on their own terms and, and in privacy. That does create as a, a challenge in that, that what we're doing is we're making life easier for the patient. So you're not actually as a provider following them up as much. You don't know whether they've tested and linked into treatment because they're doing it in, in, their, in, in privacy. So, so there are a challenge is for us. I mean, we want to do the best for people. We want, but then that may, becomes paternalistic and we start to, to maybe uh, worry a bit too much about what people are doing and how they're doing things. Um, so <clears throat> what I do want to talk about a little bit is, is the sort of work that Paranita has been talking about. And actually, I'm going to use an example that she probably generated, so, so apologies for, for that. Uh, but, but looking at mapping populations uh, and also transmission of virus, then talk a little bit about that making testing and treatment easier, then improving interactions with patients, which I think is an exciting area uh, for new technologies, and then how we coordinate all of this at scale. So, so the example from the Avaham program, I think, is a really good one of, of local use of data, where community members, peer group members, uh, were the ones doing the outreach and recording the data, linking it into clinics, and using that to help with the delivery of the programs. Then it went up uh, through a chain to um, to, to be aggregated centrally, but the key thing is it was being used locally. When we're talking about new technologies, though, we don't always have to be talking about this fancy electronic stuff. This is the sort of mapping that was done in the Abraham program, uh, and Paranita showed us some other pictures of this sort of work, where, where this old technology actually works quite well if people are, are, are taking the time to find where people are, make sure they're getting services, and record that. And that work is, is ongoing. Uh, this is a slide uh, from Francis Cowan, who's working uh, with, with Sisters with a Voice in, in Zimbabwe, where they're using the same sort of mapping technology to find who they should deliver uh, the te uh, services to in, in Zimbabwe. What's interesting here is that they're starting to computerize uh, this data and, and use the new technologies to help with the speed in which they can do this. But it starts with the old technologies and the old shoe leather epidemiology programming to find things. This is a slide from Oliver Ratman, who's in the audience. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, acquisition and transmission. In epidemiology, we can look at risk factors for acquisition 
of HIV or other diseases and infections. It's much harder to look at transmission. So we're exploring the use of uh, viral sequence data with phylogenetic analysis to see who's acquiring and transmitting infection. And this example from Ollie and his colleagues in Uganda just shows looking at the fisher communities and the, the, uh, the communities inside the population. The point I want to make about here is, is this is technology that we're, we're trying to see how, it, how applicable it is. What I wouldn't want this to be used for is to see, okay, who's the individual who's transmitting the infection? How do we prosecute them? It's got to be much more general questions about, okay, how is the virus spreading through our populations? How do we think about prioritizing our programming? Should it be uh, people who are migrating between the different communities? Should it be uh, focused in, in particular areas of the community? Uh, one of the questions that I've always been asking and what would love to answer is, is this a generalized epidemic through, through sort of fairly spread out uh, moderate density uh, networks or is it uh, driven by key populations and uh, that we need to provide services for. Okay, so moving on to some of the technologies we're using uh, to make treatment uh, easier. Uh, we have this new model of differentiated care, which is really about making life easier for the, the, the provider and the patient. Uh, and what we need here is good technology and data to manage the supply chain so we can make sure people get their drugs and, and get their drugs on time. We need good viral load monitoring to reassure everybody things, things are working. Uh, and, those, and we need data systems for patient tracking. And I think one of the key things when we're talking about the use of data for programming and tracking is that we need identifiers of people. We need unique identifiers so that we can see whether patients are coming back into care and are doing well and that we can actually provide services for them. And that's, that's one of the things that's being developed as we do this differentiated service delivery. A couple of examples. This one is the South African government's program on pharmacy distribution. I don't know why they came up with the CCMDD uh, acronym, but it's chronic, Central Chronic Medicine Dispensing and Distribution in South Africa. And this is a, a way that the, the drugs are provided to the patients with an identifier in, in, in uh, pharmacies, uh, chemists, uh, where it's easier for them to receive the drugs. And this is a data system mapping out where the drugs are needed, uh, providing the data to the patients. How long have I been talking, Ade? We'll give you a signal for two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, another example of, of providing information to patients is, is a South African one where PracHealth are using MumConnect. And what they're doing here is they're using SMS messages to provide pregnant women with, with, with information about their pregnancy, but also to get feedback from them and about the services that are they're be, being delivered. And we're hoping to, to work with PracHealth to ex experiment with uh, providing the partners of these pregnant women information on, on HIV self-tests. So, so we can start to use SMM messaging both to provide information and receive information back and start to, to provide a supportive system. Uh, another example is, is Babylon, which is working uh, in, in Rwanda. And, and what Babylon is doing is providing primary health care to people uh, through them signing up and then calling into the system. And they have an a artificial intelligence system. So, so you physicians are going to be no longer needed soon because artificial intelligence is going to take over from you. Interestingly here, though, in Rwanda, it's only just started and they're exploring into it. And, and the artificial intelligence gets wrong about 70, uh, no, 30% of the time because it's based on patients in the UK rather than patients in, in Rwanda. So, I mean, and that's not a criticism, that's, that's their learning how to do this and, and making it work. Okay, in my last minute, I just want to talk about one of the big problems in using data. And that's that, that it's so piecemeal and not properly managed and that the incentives to really use and manage the data aren't there. And that's our fault. We've started all these different programs. We've disempowered uh, the governments from, from managing these programs. And so, so we get fragmented systems with weak governance. We, people aren't incentivized to use the data. The data systems don't talk to each other, which makes the data quality uh, poor. And, the, and we are dealing often in environments that have weak infrastructure. So what we're trying to do there is, is really work with a few governments to, to strengthen the governance of their data. Let the governments own 
the system and govern it well so that they can create the human capacity to use the data well and that we can have good quality data that can really make our systems work. Okay, so I haven't got time to go through these two slides. Uh, okay, so just in, in, in conclusion, I didn't really talk much about this except at the beginning. We do, do need to earn and deserve trust when we introduce these technologies and these data. One thing we need to do when we're, we, we're do, using these data systems is we need to right-size our experiments, but then work out how we're going to scale them. It's no good just having repeated experiment after experiment after experiment. It's also no good testing something for five years and the system move on after you've tested it for five years. Uh, and the key point about all of this is that we've got to make service delivery and uptake easier for the populations we care about. Thank you. So, so we have um, this one. So we have plenty of time for questions. Just to remind everybody, so um, we're taking questions on uh, on Elizabeth's talk about on fears. We heard from Jerry about uh, the mapping of al alcohol availability in that quite stunning slide of uh, of South Africa and 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 w how easy it was for children for children at school to both access and get get uh, adverts for for um for alcohol that we heard about the sex work program the abraham work both in 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 india and 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 then moving to kenya and then finally we we heard issues about uh, using provision data for programming and jeff your example i'm sure there'll be lots of questions about unique identifiers and the coordination of data getting very political at the end there jeff so uh, the, the, the floor is now open. We have uh, three mics. If you just um, identify yourself and, uh, and tell us who you're addressing the question to. Hi, uh, it's Stephen Delgado, ICAP New York. Um, this is for my colleague, Elizabeth Radin. Um, as you know, we've heard some concerns from some of the CDC country offices regarding how the data, at least as we present them for the FIAs, may be uh, misleading in terms of the programmatic need. Uh, so because we present prevalences rather than burden, um, so say for example the 90-90-90 disaggregated by sex, you may see a large gap there from male and female, but because of the distinctly lower prevalence among males versus females, that programmatic gap may be much smaller or actually even reverse. So in terms of communicating with the public and the people making decisions for both policy and program, do we, or should we rethink the way we present those data? Okay, so um, it's a great question from someone who's been really close to the data as well. Um, and I think they're both incredibly important points and I want to use the case of, of Cote d'Ivoire to illustrate them. So uh, HIV prevalence in, in Cote d'Ivoire among women is more than twice what it is among men. So you see the women having um, a higher achievement on the 90-90-90. You see 43% of women being diagnosed versus 24% of men. Um, and it's and, and on down the, the chain of um, on treatment and virally suppressed. And if we just uh, back of the envelope map those prevalence numbers onto the population projections, Despite that difference, we see about an equal treatment gap among men and women, and that's really important to consider. There are as many, if not more, women to be found um, than men. At the same time, uh, health equity is a, you know, more and more of a, a frame that we're using as well we should, and um, I think regardless of, of what the burden is, having a situation where only 24% of men know their status is... Um, is, is certainly not something that we're going to accept either. So it's a very well taken point that both of those are things that should be should be considered: um, the burden as well as the uh, percentages, prevalence or otherwise. Uh, hi, my name is Sonal Mehta, and I'm from India HIV Alliance. And I, I want to comment on the last speaker. I, I, um, while I, I am a person who really would like to use technology for um, uh, for to, for our work, but uh, it, it kind of unique identifier and technology, when it is used for reporting, it can create problems. I mean, we we work with about global fund supported project for 1.2 million people in India, 
And we were trying to use tablet-based application called Empower to really make people report. It's an individual tracking system. It did not work until we kind of put it in on its head and made it an outreach client management tool. So the outreach workers will know who needs what services. And by the way, it also reports. Because until then, it was actually a tool to control the outreach worker as well as um, to really kind of, you know, make everybody feel that, oh, you're not working as you're supposed to work. And I've seen it used far more often, a little bit also including in Avahan in India. <laughs> and so I just want to flag that. that it's very, really important to make it the outreach worker friendly and the community friendly too. Let's take uh, uh, two or three questions and then we'll get the panel to answer. Uh, Jonathan Gunthorpe, set from Southern Africa, also for Jeff, but others. I, I wonder if you are feeling and working with or have any suggestions around the kind of fa Facebook factor when it comes to data and when it comes to particularly unique identifier data. Um, I think if we leave aside the issue of key populations, persecution, and those dangers, I think that's been talked about quite a lot at conference. But the, the other issue, the GDPR and other issues where there's a backlash against data being held at all, um, on the one hand, enormous concern for data, privacy. On the other hand, those arguments I'm often hearing coming from very privileged people in very privileged countries whose own service providers hold thousands of data points on their own health in order to service them. So, I, yeah, feedback on that. Thank you. That'd be good. Okay, great. We'll take one more question this side before we allow the speakers to, to respond. Please uh -huh. go ahead. Uh, two questions. No uh, the problem. first one to follow up the uh, last question to uh, Geoff also. Uh, I think it's great now um, more and more health programs want to um, patient level information built into the system. The issue is we've seen multiple tablets for the same nurse and some coming from the maternal child health and then the other tablet from uh, maybe TV program or another program. You talk about the data partnership. I'm wondering if you have any advice. How can we try to um, streamline those different tablets, sh making sure that maybe they just need one tablet rather than f four or five? What, what can we do? Because it's really a lot of lost opportunity of saving funds. I, I believe every tablet costs something. How do we do that? And I understand each donor may have its own focus. and. Uh, and in, uh, attention. Another question is for Paranata. I noticed in one of your um, um, data mapping for female sex workers, I saw maybe by district, I saw the digit like one or five. How did you um, um, uh, come up with this number? Do you think there may be uh, uncertainty bounds? How can you be so accurate? There is only one or five uh, female sex workers in a particular district. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's allow the speakers to respond. Okay, so so uh, great points about the level at which the data is used and the incentives for the healthcare worker, the provider, to use the data and rather than to, to be managed and uh, punitively, but to, to facilitate their work. And I think that's really a, a, an issue of, of good management and good governance and, and incentives to make sure that, that it, it is uh, driving incentives. And I think it's about the level at which you use the data. So, so a great point there. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely because uh, there is that tension between the, the sort of policing versus the providing the services, and we do want uh, our data to be used to help us. And, and, and again, it may be about the level at which the data is used and, and shared and who, who it's revealed to. I mean, certainly our investments are around trying to support that use of the data to help the patients uh, be managed, and we are investing a lot in trying to work out how we can introduce unique identifiers, and I'm doing a little bit of work on that in South Africa. Uh, in, uh, so, so I agree with you. It's just this this, this real tension that uh, about um, how the data is used, and we um, and I think it probably depends on the context as well. I mean, whether you come from a tradition of uh, a benign government versus uh, a not very nice uh, government. And anyway, so I don't have any right answers uh, for that, but it's something to to, to uh, think about uh, in terms of. Databases working together and data and systems and technologies working together. I used to be able to code 
I'm too old to be able to code modern things. But as I understand it, the, the real issue is about interoperability between different systems. Uh, which is, so it's not about creating whole new systems to contain things. It's to make them interoperable. And that's about the architecture of the system. And, and, make, and that's one of the reasons we think governance is all important, to force people to make the different data systems work together rather than being separate, proprietal, uh, not talking to each of the systems. Great. Perita? So, <clears throat> so we used uh, actually a programmatic mapping uh, process, and it's documented how you do it. Uh, it's, uh, it's geographical mapping, where at first stage you uh, actually make a list of all the hotspots that are there, and then you go to those hotspots and do key informant interviews to find out. Obviously, we don't get one number, you get a range, because you ask on a daily, on a, on a normal day, how many sex workers are here, on a peak day, Saturday, Sunday, whenever the peak day, how many, and then you come up with a range, and then you take a midpoint for more programming purposes. So these are not, uh, uh, it's not perfect science or pure science, and then you go and, uh, as a program, you validate that number. So for the presentation, you may have seen uh, those numbers, but actually it's a range that, that, that comes out. Thank you so much. Next round of questions. I have a question for Jerry. Uh, Jerry, it's a really nice presentation. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but two, two, two questions. One, do you have an idea about how much al alcohol uh, the, the, the young people are actually using? One, and, and then two, do you have any recommendations for, uh, for authorities in, in, in terms of trying to reduce both the exposure and the adver adverts? Around around schools. I mean, you said that there are laws already, but any 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 strong recommendations you might think of? Go ahead. Thank you so much. My name is Francis from South Africa. My question uh, goes to the first presenter uh, regarding the PEPFAR supported sites and the, the the percentages reported in terms of uh, diagnosis, treatment, and viral load suppression. I just wanted to know how those uh, figures compare to the national figures. Would we say uh, these uh, findings are generalizable to the different countries or not? And then um, regarding the, the myths, the presentation on the myths in terms of uh, whether men are being left behind or, or women, I just wanted to know if the percentage uh, point variations were statistically significant between men and women. You can have a variation of 5 or 10 or 20 percent, but statistically speaking, was there any significance in terms of you know, uh, the, the utilization rates? Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is John Makem from FHI 360. My question is also for Elizabeth. Um, like many surveys, um, you rely on self-reported behavior. So there's the impact of social desirability bias. So I was curious if you thought that might have played a f role in what, we, what you saw. So for example, you highlighted that loss to follow-up was less than what we expected. Could that have been due to some type of social desirability bias where individuals self-reported they're still in treatment? Um, when they are not. And then furthermore, I was curious if you had a chance to take the data you've collected and kind of triangulate it with programmatic data to see if it's telling the same story or if we're seeing something different in the programmatic data versus the surveillance data. Over to the presenters. We'll start with you, Elizabeth. Start with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so to the question on uh, diagnosis, treatment, and the how the 90-90-90 in, oh, how the 90-90-90 in, in PEPFAR sites compares, um, to be clear, with the exception of the PED slides where it said PEPFAR, all of this data is from household-based surveys, so it's not facility-based data. It's nationally representative household-based data, um, and uh, essentially that is the national estimates um, at, this, at this point. 
Um, the exception is the, the PEDS data, and I really recommend looking at the paper by uh, Suzue Saito and, the, and uh, UNAIDS and PEPFAR colleagues in the JADES um, Act supplement that just came out yesterday uh, to look at how well the data compared across programs. It varies a bit by country, and it's worth looking at the specificity. Um, to the question on whether the differences between men and women were statistically significant, um, I'll say that broadly these were large samples and certainly in the higher prevalence countries those larger gaps in the first 90 in a number of cases were significant. The one and two percentage point gaps um, are almost never significant. Um, more specifically, all of these 90-90-90s uh, are posted with confidence intervals on uh, summary sheets on our website. Uh, there's also longer reports for the first three studies, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, that we did. Um, and uh, those include some more granular data about sample size and confidence intervals, so we'll refer you to those. Um, thanks to John, who said he's from FHI, but he was part of the Zimfia team when we were starting that up. Um, and, and we had a lot of... Uh, I mean, and he is truly from FHI now, but he was part of the Zimfia team when we were starting that up, and we're really grappling with this question about self-report. Um, the answer for the loss to follow-up slides was that I based those entirely on biomarkers. So that was, well, let me say, that was the percentage of people who had viral suppression, which is a, a biomarker, among people who were aware. and. For that question, I used the self-reported uh, status of aware. So it's possible people uh, weren't disclosing their accurate status there. A few ways that we can compare that are the forthcoming ARV biomarker data. So we can look at people who told us they were unaware of their status and see what proportion of those uh, had some detectable ARVs in their blood. That data is coming very shortly. Um, and another thing to do is to kind of triangulate across different reports. So, for example, looking at some of the high-level data we have on, on violence and social factors like that with surveys that, you know, really specialize in those areas and, and um, triangulating to look at that self-report question. But certainly an important lens that I would recommend bringing to this and any other questionnaire-based data. Yeah, thank you. So in term, I'll start with the second one. So in terms of uh, recommendations and uh, <clears throat> in terms of policy, uh, so we've, as I said uh, in our presentation, we've used the, the data from our studies uh, to engage policymakers. So for example, in Tanzania, where we don't have an analogal policy, we've been working with the Ministry of Health <coughs> uh, to draft one. Uh, several drafts uh, have gone through, and now we've included that uh, issues around policy in the revised national health policy, which is about to come out. Uh, we, we've had uh, some success. So through our studies, we've shared uh, uh, our data with, uh, with stakeholders, uh, several uh, meetings uh, in, in Tanzania. And uh, really, one of the issues that we uncovered was, you know, uh, alcohol packaging, small, small packets, which, which were called sachet, which was quite common in country. Uh, and through our work and engaging with the policymaker and other people in the in the in the in the, in the area, uh, <coughs> we were able to uh, in 2017 the government of, of Tanzania banned the sachets for several reasons. But one of the the citation of evidence was basically it was affecting young people. So you can really have an impact in in terms of you know engaging uh, policymakers. Uh, in terms of uh, use, uh, we, uh, you know, we've uh, applied uh, uh, <clears throat> the audit score. Uh, it was not validated in this population uh, of young people. Uh, it was mostly used in, young, uh, in adults, but we've done a study in Tanzania, uh, uh, and we've generally, I don't have the figures in my head now, but we've found that alcohol use is higher among males compared to females. You can find all these resources and information in the Strive website, so please visit there. Great. Thank you so much to all the speakers for your insight, um, your presentations in making sure that the right programs are, are delivered to the right people. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everybody who's been here this afternoon. I'm sure the speakers are going to hang around for another five to ten minutes if you want to ask them any questions directly. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.